I was one of those guys that believed, well, healers don't heal broken teeth, <laughs> right? Everybody accepts that, right? You got a broken tooth. And I'm thinking, well, I've healed all these other things. What's the difference between broken teeth and a broken kneecap or somebody in a coma? Nothing. And I went home and I applied the technique that I'm going to show you today. And I worked on, on it. And when I went to the dentist three days later, he had two dentists, him and his partner. Two dentists are going to work on me. One guy was going to pull the three teeth, which didn't sound like a lot of fun, but I said, do whatever you're going to do. And the other guy was going to do a root canal, which didn't sound like a lot of fun either. I left there 45 minutes later with nothing. No fillings, no root canals, no teeth extracted, no cat with a crown. You put a crown on a molar. Three broken molars, not even a crown. I don't know what they did. They refused to tell me what they did. Oh, we, we just technical stuff. We fixed your teeth. Well, 10 minutes before this, I sat down in the chair. They showed me the x-rays and said, this is what we're going to do. So if the power of self-love can heal broken teeth, think about that. That's a high energy frequency. I've shared a video on that, and I've had hundreds, I wouldn't say thousands, but I've had hundreds of messages from people that they had bad teeth, teeth pulling. It, it, they've alleviated the pain, either 100% or 50%. Nobody said they fixed their broken teeth, so I'm just saying maybe it was an accident they got fixed. But I'm telling you, if you believe it, it is a fact. If you believe today that there's no amount of anything, love or anything else that can fix you, you're wrong. All right, so we're going to talk about physical healing. We're going to talk about emotional healing. Because honestly, emotional healing is more important than the physical. If you're not happy and you're depressed and you're anxiety ridden and you're, you got mental illness, you got all these other things going on, shape of the body is not the top priority. We'll work on that today. But the most important thing, which I guarantee, guarantee, all of you are going to have your spiritual energy altered, changed. The frequency is going to be higher than when you came in here. So on the energy healing for spirituality, yes, trust me. And most people do, and they open their hearts. Right. So when I was 18 years old, and some people can attest the fact I was 18 once, right? <laughs> we won't say how many years ago. So I, I moved to Hawaii. And in the Hawaiian Islands, I met up with a guy at Kahuna. And in, how many people went to my sermon today? Okay, I'll, oh, you've already heard the story. All right. So, but the Kahuna taught me three things about healing, just to reiterate. He says, you want to heal somebody, you got to teach them to love themselves. you got to teach them to forgive themselves. And they have to have gratitude. they got to be thankful and grateful for everything that comes into their life. <clears throat> so if you ever wonder where that kind of idea came from, this is not an idea that came to me one day. This is something in the Hawaiian Islands that's pretty much a way of life. And now it has fancy names and other stuff. But back then... This was in 1964, and this old kahuna is 60-some years old, and I was an 18-year-old surfer. I go, well, that's, that's interesting, but not necessarily what I'm looking for. <laughs> Decades later, I realized I've been living my whole life already adapted to and processing and living that very basic philosophy, loving myself, forgiving myself, and I was grateful. Hell, a guy like me, I'm grateful I get up in the morning every day. Now at my age, it's like, oh, wow, whoa, another day. All right. I'm not sure about my wife. If she's, uh, he's here again. Right. You can edit that. Anyway, uh, so let's go back to where this thing first started because this healing thing was kind of a modified spiritual evolutionary process. 
starting when I was in the hospital at eight years old. I was in the hospital for one year of my life. No television, no radios, no toys, no smartphones, not even a dumb phone, <laughs> no coloring books, no toys, no visitors, no kids. I was alone, restricted to a bed, not even allowed to walk around for one year. Missed the whole, most all of third grade. And I had visitors like uh, five, ten minutes on Sundays. My mother and my stepdad would come by and breeze through and tell me how great everything's going and they'd leave. That would be the rest of the time I'm by myself. So I had all that time. So what happened in that year? One, I had a near-death experience first night there. Some of you probably watched a video on it or something, I'm assuming. Okay. The first night I was there, they did some procedures on me. They put me in a room in isolation ward. I'm eight years old, first time I'm ever away from home. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm not in my body. There's no loss of consciousness. I'm still me. But I notice that there's no weight. I'm like elevated, observing my body below. Looking is a bad thing because I don't have any eyes to look. It's not physical. But I'm aware my body is laying, you know, in this bed. I got this little kid. And I go, I feel sorry for that body. If that body's in pain, that's not very good. So that was the beginning of, of a night where I had what you call a near-death experience. And instead of having a look at my life backwards, a, a, a life review, at eight years old, what are going to review, right? Not much. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, but I had a, a vision that was more real than a vision. Vision you know, implies, no, this is like real. And I saw myself 50 years. I didn't know at the time, but it was 50 years going forward until I was going to be 58 and a half years old. And I say that because at 50 years to the day later, when I was in India, 2004, I went to Babaji's cave, which I dreamt about going and had a vision of going there. But that's where all my visions ended. And coming back from Babaji's cave, I had a heart attack and fell off a 30-foot cliff in the Himalayan mountains. Boom! And I'm on a rock. And all of a sudden, I'm not on a rock. My body's on a rock, but I'm not on a rock. And I'm, I'm up looking at it, sensing it, realizing that, oh, I've been here before. We've left the body again. And there's this ugly, broken body down there. It doesn't look too good. And that was 50 years later. But all those visions I had, by the way, I survived. Just, <laughs> I didn't want to leave you hanging on that one. I mean, uh, suspense was killing me. Uh, but why, to go back to this near-death experience, I saw 50 years in advance, I saw who my wife was going to be. I saw her and what she looked like in high school. I saw my children. I saw the jobs I was going to have. I saw myself in a war, flying around in helicopters. I didn't understand anything about it. I didn't know where Vietnam was. But I saw myself there behind a machine gun on a Huey helicopter. Didn't know it was a Huey helicopter. It just looked like a funny helicopter. At that time, I said, it looked like a toad. You know how toads look? You know, before they become a frog. And that's where I knew, for those who were at my sermon, so there's a pop quiz, those who are my sermon, how did I know not to fire at those children? Because I had a vision of it. The army ain't going to buy why I did it. No, I had a vision of this 50 years. No, no. It's, and so when I saw those children, I knew instantaneously, this is something. I'm here for this purpose and this reason. And if I was a different person there, instead of me, history would have been changed and we would have had another my life. It would have been a bad thing. So... I saw the Kennedy assassination. I told, I told our high school principal, Stanga, and some of the staff, and they go, oh, thank you, Bill. Yeah, that's all right, but this is three weeks before we get, uh, don't worry about it, you know. And then he gets killed, and all of a sudden, how'd you know, Bill? How'd you know? Well, when I had the vision, I didn't know there was Kennedy alive. I mean, he wasn't even anything back, you know, in the early 1950s, you know, 
senator, maybe a congressman. I had no clue who he was. So that's setting the stage for what I did that year in the hospital. I give you that little piece of the puzzle just to kind of lay out my state of mind. My state of mind was I got a year in this hospital. They told me I'm incurable. I may never get out of this hospital. That's something I haven't really discussed before. But letting a kid overhear conversations from the doctors and nurses, it looks like I was going to be there until I was dead. I was already a ward of the state. You know, the county had me. And so there was no medical decisions being made by my parents. It was all being made by the staff. So I thought, wow. So I remembered my mother, who was a member of the Self-Realization Fellowship. That everybody knows? Okay. And uh, you don't know about that? SR? Okay, you'll tell them that good. They teach, Yogananda teaches a practice called energizing exercises. And these exercises are designed to make your body, energy-wise, better at your meditation. So you do these things, which is visualizing energy coming through your chakras and the energy going through your muscles. And then you're, 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 some of the exercises you tighten up, like you're lifting imaginary weights. This whole thing is about 37, I think, exercises you do. And I remember that, even at eight years old, because I remember I, I knew I'd do the exercises, and I thought, well, that's a way of getting energy, but I don't need it to meditate. I want to use it for me, getting better, healing. And I found that by visualizing energy coming down through, I, at the time, top of my head, now I'd say the crown chakra, but then you know, I'm eight years old, yeah, coming through the top of my head, I visualize this light and coming out. And I realized that there was a potentiality for this energy to be stored and used to actually fix my body, to help heal it. So I was able to get out of the hospital after years instead of dying or anything, you know, or being stuck there forever. So my first week home, our family dog runs out in front of the, uh, on Fair Oaks Boulevard, for those that know the area, it's Sunnyvale, runs out and gets run over by a car going about 40 miles an hour. Boom, flattens part of its body. Its tongue's hanging out, its blood coming out corners of its, of its mouth, nostrils, blood coming out, ears, blood coming out, eyes, tear ducts, blood coming out, and it's just whimpering. I mean, it's on death's edge. And the driver, of course, is crying. And at the time, I didn't understand how a, an old guy, must have been 30 years old, this old guy was crying <laughs> and hit a dog. I was going, you know. Anyway, so I come in the house carrying the dog, and I sat it down, and I realized... I don't know how I realized, but I realized that I could fix this dog through the power of my love and this energizing stuff that I had developed. And so I sat with the dog. I visualized this energy coming down through my crown chakra, coming out my fingertips. And so when I, so when I grabbed somebody, when I reached out and I grabbed this dog and I kind of did a like that, you know, and I, I visualized the energy going to the dog. The dog just went, boom, jumped up like it got shot with electricity, ran around the house, never took him to a vet. But it wasn't just the energy. It was love. Because I really, really loved the dog. And so I go, hmm, love and energy. There's the combination. So then when I went to Hawaii to get back to the kahuna, and he's telling me about this other stuff, and I'm going, well, I'll put that aside for a while. And then when my daughter was in college, and I was away, she called me, and she goes, Dad, Dad, you know, you, you, you got to give permission. I, I just blew my knee out. I went to Kaiser, and it's got like 33 pieces broken in it or something. The knee, she was skiing. It was Squaw Valley, now they call it what, Paradise? Tahoe Paradise. It's politically correct now. And, but she was there with all these college friends, and they went night skiing. She's not a skier. Night skiing on short skis on the Olympic run, you know, downhill. Yeah, okay, fine. So I told her, I said, no surgery. You wait. I'll be home. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'll be home in a week. We don't need surgery. She goes, Dad, you ain't even seen it. 
I've seen the x-rays. The doctors are telling me they're just waiting for the swelling to go down to work on it. I guess you have to wait until it goes down. And I said, nope, I'll be home. So I get home, and I took her into my meditation room, and I said, take, I took her crutches, I put them off side. She had a soft cast on. And I said, take, take the cast off. Take the cast off. Had she hesitated at that point, it wasn't going to work. She had to be totally trusting. So she takes soft cast off. She lays down. And I, I give her a picture of Paramahansa Yogananda. I tell her, just hold it. I had my prayer beads, something like that. And I took my hands and I put them on her knees. And she's laying in my meditation room. And I just visualized love and energy. I remembered the dog. This is stupid. My daughter will go, what, you equating me to a dog? But I remembered what I did for the dog. And I said, what's the difference? What's the difference? And she's not going to be dead. This is just a knee, right? Right? So I grabbed the knee, and, and I give her a shot of energy at uh, probably three minutes. Just, uh, I'm sweating. I fall over. I'm exhausted. Whew. I get up, and then I look at her. I said, Get up and get out of here. Without hesitation, she got up and walked out of there. She couldn't walk before. And then, oh, yeah, it's all gone, right? So then she goes to the doctor the next week. The doctor's got the x-rays up. This is the pre-surgery meeting. And he goes, yeah. And then he looked at her walking in, and he goes, and he looks at the x-rays, and he goes, well, what happened? You're not on, he says, and she told him what I did. And the doctors laughed, of course, well, your dad didn't do anything. It must have healed on its own. I said, okay, fine. So she tells me that when she gets home. It's healed miraculously on its own. Spontaneous healing. And I said, okay. Okay. Next day, she falls down our stairs in our two-story house. And I heard a scream so loud. She blew that same knee out. It was worse than it was the first time. When you grabbed onto it, you could feel little pieces go. And so I go, come on. You didn't believe me the first time. There was doubt, right? Come on. Later down, did the same exact thing again, except this time I planted a little sub subliminal thought. I just go, we're going to do this, but you're only going to be 95% healed. For six months, you're just going to feel a little, just a little twitch. That's exactly what happened. She got up and goes, yeah, it's almost perfect, except it did. Six months later, it was 100%. She didn't believe what happened the first time. At some level, she allowed her to be, that to be talked out of her. And I didn't plan it. I didn't ask God to have her fall down the stairs for a demonstration. <laughs> but it was like the universe saying, okay, kid, let's do it again. Don't believe all this other stuff. This is real. I've done this for people that have been in comas in hospice care, in comas, they're not supposed to come out. Boom, they sit up, they look at me, what's going on? I don't change your death date, and neither do you. That's written, like on a milk carton. That's it, your star chart, that's it, right? Unless the divine has a reason to change it for you, for their purpose. So, and I say that because I had a neighbor, and she was in the hospital in a coma, and I went to visit her. I, I played the reverend card. You know, you can't go into ICU. You know, but I go, no, I'm her, I'm, her, I'm her minister. Oh, okay. By the way, it works, in case you ever want to. I should start handing them out to people. You're a minister here. So, so I go in there, and I, and, I, and I remember her telling me before she, was, when, before she went unconscious, because she was dealing with spinal cancer, and uh, broke her back, and she was in a, you know, it, it, it was bad. That she just wanted to be alive during the holidays. This was like a week before Christmas. Because her son, her youngest son, was uh, married, and he was getting ready to have his first grandchild. And she, she wanted to see the grandchild. I mean, this is a big deal, right? She wanted to see this grandchild, and she wanted to have a picture taken with her grandson or granddaughter, whatever it was going to be. And that's all I can remember. And she just, her desire, she told me before she was unconscious, was to spend Christmas at home 
and have a picture taken with her grandkid because she hadn't met the grandkids yet. So I did that, and she kind of had a flash of consciousness, and then I left. Next day, I find out they released her. She was wide awake. And they go, well, you're, you're terminal, you're, you're, you know, but you might as well die at home instead of here, right? We're not going to do anything but make you comfortable. So she goes home. She's in a wheelchair. I go over there, and she's sitting in a wheelchair with this baby. Just got born. And she gets a picture, and she's happy. The family's happy. And she died right after the first of the year. She still died when she was supposed to die. But she had that desire. And that's okay. I say that because when you start thinking you're a healer, number one, only the Creator heals. And when you start thinking that you're doing all these things for these people, be careful. There's karma involved. And when you're taking somebody's reason to burn that karma off, you better have that light that's green that says, go ahead, this is okay. You can cure this person. Because there's been people come to me and I'm going, I just got a red light. I, 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 I'll help you with your pain. Help you with your pain. And comfort, I have no problem with that. But when you start taking away people's things like that, you're changing and altering their life course, and you're responsible. And I say that in relation to a story that I had told me when I was in India. And this guy tells up, he tells a story about this guru in this local village, revered, everybody wanted to have him. And there was a town drunk, rich guy, but drunk and terrible father, husband, everything. And he goes up and he just got the diagnosis of stage four cancer, right? He's going to die in six months. So he goes to the guru and he goes, Guru, uh, you heal me. I'm going to become your most, you know, I'm going to donate money. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to bring converts to you. I'm going to do all these wonderful works and things. Just cure me. So the guru didn't give it a lot of thought. He just cured the guy. Nine months later, into this little village comes this car with this guy, and he's mad. He has to see the guru. His family was killed by a drunken driver, which was the guy that he just cured. Had he been left to his own merits, he'd been dead in six months. But the guru gave him an extra three months there, that killed a family. And this family looked at him and said, it's, you know, that, and, and, and they started yelling at him. And he goes, yes, that's now my karma, which means he has the karma of the death of those people on his hands. So be really, that's really dramatic, but be really, really careful when you go out and you think you're going to cure the world and change the world and do things and heal people. You have to have an exercise of wisdom. You have to really know Yes or no. And there's times that no is all right. Now, when it comes to healing yourself, it's you. It's your karma. Do whatever the heck you want to do. Not a problem. That's why I teach self-healing. If it's your granddaughter, your, your kid, your, yeah, you got to do what you got. I ain't got to fault anybody on that. Do whatever you got to do. But be really careful about reaching out beyond that level. Okay? What I'm teaching you today, you can use on others but I'm teaching it to use on you. And the big thing is for you to believe and accept. And there's a difference between faith and belief and knowing. When you get past the faith and the belief, which is wishes, I wish, yeah, I, 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 it's a possibility, I, I believe that, to the, no, that will happen. It's fundamentally a huge energy shift. It's getting to that knowing. And the only way you get there is through spiritual wisdom gained by meditation, prayer, association with those that are advanced, and doing everything you can to change your frequency and energy. But we'll get back to that frequency and energy. We're going to talk about that. Because... Each of us has a certain vibration. You wonder how you attract the people into your life that you do. You have a circle of friends. You got people. You marry people. Birds of a feather flock together. They always, that's the old saying, right? Well, energy attracts the same kind of energy. For example, 
if you married a, a, a wife beater and then you divorce, what's the likelihood you're going to marry the next guy and he's going to be the same thing? Probably good, unless you've changed your energy field. It's always you that has to change, which gets us down to this. You're ill. You're sick. You're not a victim. Life doesn't randomly say, you're going to get MS, you're going to get cancer. You know. Everything could be traced if you were the great cosmic, you know, uh, the great cosmic predictor. You could look and say, well, here's how he lived his life 10 years, 10 lifetimes ago, and here's what he thinks, and here's what he does. Here's what he Everything is predictable. Your karma is an accumulation of all your thoughts, deeds, actions from all lifetimes, including your desires, your wants, your wishes, how you treated others, even your diet, everything, what you read, what you watch, how you treat others. So as I talked about my sermon today, because I can remember what I said there, I should repeat myself, but it's like people with their, their boards, they're, they're trying to manifest something on a board. Everything you do is your manifesting process. Everything that you do, say, creates tomorrow for you or the present now. Everything is a product of your own making. Oh, that's not true. I, you know, I, you know, I was looking for a victim. Now, that's 99.9% .9 of the people. There are a small percentage of people that will take on illnesses, the sicknesses, the injuries, and the hardships of others. Somebody like Jesus or St. Francis or, you know, whatever gurus and saints you might. There's some of those people out there that actually work in karma for you. But when you start thinking that's you, well, let's dig a little. Take a look at your own life. Someplace along the line you've added to this. So, Throw in all that information and the fact that everything's energy. I devised, I, I was laying around during COVID, just at the end of COVID, and I had a, a visionary dream. And I saw myself doing this. Large groups, like, you know, a thousand people in India, you know, a dozen or so people here, you know, whatever it was. Different sized groups. But I also saw who they were. I also knew that there was no insignificant small group. If I saw them, I needed to be there. It's like this group. I mean, my wife's going, you're going to drive, you know, 1,000 miles round trip, you know, to go down there, and, you know, to hand. I go, there's somebody there that needs this. That's all that counts. But when I had my third near-death experience, remember I talked about the first two, a third near-death experience, where I had not just an out-of-body experience, I had a, a physical body manifested in India at the same time I was laying on an operating table in Sacramento. That's another whole story of another day. But while I was there, I was in this physical body in India while my other body was being ripped apart for open-heart surgery, eight hours, I met a group of rishis, same rishis that wrote the Nadis, the Nadi palm leaf readings, in case you have reference to that. And then uh, this guru at the ashram that sent me to get my readings was there as well. And I met these guys, and, and I, there was an exchange of energy, frequencies, things happened. That's another whole thing I don't want to go down. But what happened was I was shown a vision and given a choice. It was, you're going to come back into life. You choose not to die now. Um, great, you don't owe anybody anything. We're going to give you peace and rest. I got this beautiful voice telling me, you know, you, you've done enough. You know, you served. But if I chose to go back, I was going to get more pain and suffering than I ever had in my entire life. More than I ever had. And that has been one very true statement. <laughs> And I wasn't going to use my magic anymore because I've used magic, Himalayan, Tibetan, Indian, Nadi things that I've learned in my life for 
I could go to the dentist and sit there and just drill my teeth down to the nerve and I just sit there, and, but I've already got it all out. It's, it's, there's nothing there. Not anymore. Now I feel every, every pain, every ache. That was my gift for coming back, right? But before that, and I go, well, that's not much of an offer. And then they showed me this panorama in the sky and the clouds on this hilltop. Thousands and thousands and thousands of faces. And I was told, you don't owe any of these people anything. But you're going to deprive them of something. They're not going to hear your words. They're not going to read your books. They're not going to be healed. They're not going to be inspired. There's something that you're going to give these people. And you will know when you go out because even if one person shows, that person was in your vision. It's never been about thousands. It's about each individual one of you. Yes, all of you. So when I saw that and I came back and things happened, and um, just for the record, open heart surgery is, is, is not as much fun as it sounds. Uh, but uh, survived. Just another teaser there. I did survive. I don't want to keep you guys hanging all the time. Did he die? Did he? <laughs> he looks pretty dead up there right now, but did he die? No. So that's when during COVID, COVID was winding up that I had this other vision, and the vision was seeing small groups and stuff like this, and I was told in this vision, go out and do it. I have no clue. I didn't have a, I didn't have a training program. And you can look at me now. Is there a training program? Am I following a schedule? Has this guy got any kind of program? No, nothing. I just get up and, being a typical Irishman, I just talk, right? What I was told is not what I say. It's not even how I say it. It's the energy from the words. So if I came up here and just told stupid stories, which I'm probably going to do, it doesn't matter. Because even right now, right now, some of you are already feeling it pretty good. It's changing. It's real. It's not your imagination. We're changing your actual vibration, the frequency of it. And why is that so important? It's like you want to watch television. You want to see the show that's on ABC, but you got your TV tuned in to CBS. You're never going to see it. You got the wrong frequency. You want to see the saints and the sages and see all these beautiful things? If your frequency is tuned into CBS, you're not going to see anything else. You got to be at the same level. You got to meet the masters. They can step down a little bit. You got to step up. And I say that because I'm going to give you a story to illustrate how a group can have different vibrations. A group about, I don't know, it was about a half a dozen people. I was in an ashram outside of Pune. And uh, I just had a major heart attack. I was coming back for that operation I just talked about. But I was at the ashram saying goodbye. I was sitting in the kitchen. I was in a chair. I was sitting with my back to the kitchen door. And you know that feeling when you're in a movie theater or something when somebody's staring at your back? You, you felt that, right? You know when somebody's staring at you. I don't know how you know, but you know, what are you looking at? You know that person's looking at you, right? It's weird. That's the feeling I got. I turn around, and standing in flesh and bone, not a vision, not a vision, not a dream, is Sri Teshwar, the guru of Paramahansa Yogananda. And he's standing there. He's got his arms like this, and he's got his arms like this, and he's like this, and... I'm watching him, and he's looking at me like, I mean, he's moving. It's like, and I'm going, does anybody else see this? Because there's all these people in the room, right? I mean, I just had a major heart attack and collapsed, right, in the stadium. It was about three, 4,000 people in the stadium. I collapsed, and it was like, it's like I, I look at these two girls. They were from Finland or Sweden or one of the Scandinavian countries, and they just come from Goa where they were, doing yoga on the beach and their leotards and their yoga outfits and, you know, and all that stuff. To them, yoga was, you know, all the, I can't do them anymore, but all the <laughs> postures, right? 
I don't want to posture here. But anyway, so you got the drift. So that was their idea, right? And they were this ashram because it was cool and, you know, and they were chit-chatting with each other. And I go, did, did you go, ladies, do you see anything? I go, what are you, this crazy guy here? What's this old guy talking about? There's, there's nothing there. You know, and then just go back to yakking. Then there was this guy from Texas that was about in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. I said, you, you see anything? And he goes, he says, I see the biggest light, this big, huge light behind you. It's like a sun shining, like rays coming off it. And he says, and I'm feeling overwhelmed with love. This guy you know, was a serious meditator. I go, okay. Then there was another guy, Jewish lawyer. This goes to show the stereotype. Nah, they could be saintly too. <laughs> I asked him, what did you see? And he goes, you ain't going to believe it, Bill. And I said, no, tell me. He says, I'm having a vision. He says, it's kind of getting kind of clear here. He sees a vision, you know, kind of like of Seward Teshwar standing here, and he demonstrates what he looks. I said, yes. So there you had a situation where I saw flesh and blood in front of me. That's it. I could go out and grab it. The other guy that had been meditating a long time saw a vision of that. Not flesh and blood, but a vision of it. You know, kind of like watching television or something. And then the other one sees the blazing light. I mean, that's a... You've got to realize those other two people had high frequencies. That's pretty darn good. I mean, I was impressed. And the girls... They weren't in it. They saw nothing. They felt nothing, saw nothing. It's like when I was in Tucson, Arizona, and I had filled up a church there, and I was giving this hour and a half talk, if you can imagine me talking for an hour and a half. <laughs> and when I'm talking, I notice it's about, about a half hour to go, 20 minutes to go, Almost 80% of the audience was crying. And I'm not telling sad stories. I'm inspirational. I'm doing all my stuff. And then I, I had tears coming down my cheeks, and I'm going. And my body was tingling, and my kundalini, for those who understand what I'm talking about, the kundalini, the energy in your spine is tingling. And I look up. Saintly light above them. There was like angelic, I'll let it go at that, angelic energy. Nobody in this audience has seen it, but 80% of them felt it to the emotional level of tears. I talked about it afterwards to a few people. I go, yeah, I was, yeah, I was crying. I don't know why I was crying. It was a great class, a great lecture, but I was crying. When you have an energy frequency so high and so full of love, it brings you to tears, joyous tears, not sad tears, not depressed tears, but it's so, the frequency vibrates at such a level that it, it overwhelms the physical body. You've experienced something like that. You know what I'm talking about. Now, you really want to feel old, I was going to say, you know what I'm talking about, Willis, right? No. But not anybody, the young people will never understand that. Anyway, so I'm pointing this out that what you see is not based on what you believe so much as what you allow yourself to accept as fact. Christopher Columbus, he's still in the history books, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> he's been demoted. Anyway, Christopher Columbus comes. He sailed in with three ships, uh, three ships into this island, right? Those Native Americans or whatever they were back on that island, those natives never saw ships from Europe before. They sailed right in the harbor. They still didn't see them because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. It was like digitally taken out. It wasn't until they came ashore and stuff, then they could see the ships. But at first, they could not see the ships. And I've gone, that's crazy. So UCLA, right down the road from your place, UCLA had a, did an experiment, and it was on television. I watched it on Brain Games, if you ever watched that show. And... They took this class of students from UCLA, they brought them into this little theater, and they told them, okay, this is your final grade in whatever class it was, observations, analysis, or something. Your job is to sit here and watch these six couples dancing on the stage here. 
How many times they changed partners, how many different combinations they were. Your entire grade is going to be based on the question I ask you at the end of this. So that was the, you know, the thing, the question I asked you. So you made it look like, anyway. So everybody's focusing on every time they switch partners, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then when he gets out there and he says, okay, anybody answer this question gets an A. And they all go, huh. they all, yeah, and they all got their numbers and everything. And he goes, how many of you saw the six-foot man in a gorilla suit dancing with them? That one hand goes up. And they all laughed. Ha, ha, ha. And then they showed the video. And the guy comes in and dances in each circle and leaves the stage. And not one person observed it because they were only focused on how many partners they were. So think about this. You're only focused on me right now. What are you missing in this room? Hold that thought. Sensing that we're ready to kind of get down to the nitty gritty. So I'll give you a couple more healing instances how this thing works. And by me telling you about those, I'll tell you how I worked on them because that's the clue how you work on yourself. Now, uh, how many people here saw pictures I posted once upon a time that Facebook put a line through, said they were violent and graphic? There were pictures of me having my face all cut up. Oh, yeah, it was scary. It was scary, right? No, it, it was all, picture this face without a nose with just a big hole. I won't, I won't show you that one. But I, I've had, in the last... Three and a half years, I've had 15 facial surgeries, 300 and some stitches, and uh, top of the head cut off, uh, forehead entirely removed, all skin here were gone, meat. This nose three times. Now it sounds casual. It sounds yeah okay. Trust me, <laughs> trust me. You wake up one day and look in the mirror and you and you go, who in the hell is that looking back at me? That's pretty ugly. But, all right, here's the lesser ones. Here's where I started to heal. So when I say, this, this, is, one, this is one of the last surgeries. So it's not too awful. Yeah, just, you know, I've been cut, sliced, dice. All right. Same kind of stuff. It's just a whole bunch of pictures like that. And as you can see this one here, they split the forehead, and then you see stitches go from here all the way down to the other, through the eye right here. There you go. No. Nope, nope. This is, this is them surgically cutting my face up for skin cancer. So when somebody says, ah, I just got skin cancer. Well, I've had just skin cancer since 1979, and I've had so many operations. Yeah, you get a lot of skin cancer, a little, you know, liquid nitrogen. Well, that's just the beginning. Then they start cutting and, and one, two stitches. Then pretty soon you get 68 stitches. Then you get 300 stitches. So how did I deal with that? Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and physically. First off, when I was given these diagnoses and I went and got these things done, I left it to God, the results. I didn't tell God, Spare me this. You know, I don't want the surgery. No, no, it was, I never asked to be cured. I never asked to be healed. To me, asking is no faith. You're telling the all-knowing God what's good for you. God, you don't know this, but I'm, I'm sick, and you got to do this for me. Like, you didn't know that, right? So to me, when you pray for selfish things like that, you're denying the the, the all-knowing God, to give you what you need, not what you want. There's a difference. So my prayer is always, give me courage, give me faith, give me wisdom, give me the tools I need to handle this. I don't even ask for pain reduction. Just whatever good comes out of this, let me know. And so for me going through all those surgeries, imagine 15 of them in three years. I say, every so many months you get your face cut up. I think it was harder on my wife than it was on me, to be honest with you, though, because she had to, I never looked at myself. It's like, you know, because that's hard for somebody you love to look at, you know, and I go, oh, my God. But you're looking at this, and if I had not talked about my nose being cut up and all that stuff, now you start to look at it. You go, oh, there's some defects. Yeah, 
But you know, initially, it doesn't jump at you. Or at least that's my illusion. So I don't believe it jumps out there. I don't think of myself as scarred up. And just that state of mind cloaks it for other people. In other words, if I was worried about a pimple in my nose and I kept thinking about it, everybody's going to see it, right? But you just, you don't, you don't give it any energy. So I'd, Anyway, so I'd have these surgeries, and I'm going to tell you right now, the VA hospital and Kaiser both, no surgeon will work on you. You tell the surgeon, nah, just go ahead and cut. I don't need no, no, no. they won't do it. I've tried, I've asked to call me crazy, but I go, just, just, just cut it, right? because they don't want to be cutting in and you're jumping. And I don't think they can actually, because I've watched them and, the, and it's like, you know, they got the guitar face, you know, like those high notes you play on a guitar. They got that face when they're cutting you. Because I like to be awake. I like to see everything happening, right? So they give me locals because I just give me just enough when, it's, when you're done, let it wear off, right? If it starts to wear off a little bit before you're done, that's okay. Finish the stitch, get out of there. So I'd go home drive from the VA, I'd get home and sometimes it'd really be bleeding for hours, it'd be really ugly. And then I just go, I put my hands on my, on the scars, wherever they were at, the nose, the forehead, wherever. And I just loved it. I, I love you forehead, I love you nose, I love you eyes, I love you whatever it is. I love you, meaning the wounds, yourself, everything. To me, it was all the same as saying, I love God. This is God. This is God's dream body in me. This is, I'm loving me. I'm loving it. And you're supposed to love your enemies. Well, the cancer is the enemy, so I love the cancer. Thank you, cancer. And I meant that because by virtue of me going through all that I went through in the last three years, I found a way to teach healing. You would have not listened to me. If I came to you and say, this works, and then go, well, prove it. Well, what, you have never had anything happen to you, right? In the sermon I talked about, would you, would you go to, a, would you go to a, a non-drinker to get sober? No, you go to a former alcoholic that shows you how to do it. So I'm telling you, I felt every pain that you feel or could feel heightened. I mean, I've demanded to feel it. Let's do it. And then I worked on this method of, I love you. I forgive me for, like for the skin cancer, I forgave myself for all those hours sitting in a, in a lifeguard chair, being a scuba instructor on the beach, swim team once upon a time, surfing, getting sunburned, 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 Agent Orange, gasoline dousing me, all this stuff from NOM. I apologize to myself, but I forgave myself. And I asked the skin to forgive me. Crazy. This, you know, okay, this is where I leave. Everybody getting up. This time to go. And then I was grateful. I spent equal amount of time with gratitude, thinking this is a gift. And how, what kind of gift can you get from losing your nose? Credibility when you talk about this. I couldn't get a better credibility. I'm telling you, look at the nose. That's built from his shoulder. Come on, give me a break, right? <laughs> so everything that happens to you, you can take a couple ways. First way is I could have said, damn, I'm a victim. All this, why is it happening to me? This is terrible. The Army did this to me. Vietnam did this to me. You know, all this terrible stuff. And I could have moaned and groaned and complained. I still would have went through with the surgeries. Well, were they healed as good? I'm telling you, those pictures I showed you, within three weeks of these surgeries, I'd look just like I did now. I'd be back to this state. Because I went to this one guy. They, they cut the nose off one day, but they weren't going to do anything about it till the next day. So I had to go 24 hours without a nose. So I show up and I tell the doc, I go, are you, you going to do this a VA, Veterans Administration? I said, are you going to do some plastic surgery and build something nice there, right? Because it's just big, ugly stuff, right? And he goes, no, 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 that's not our job. Our job is to close the holes. Oh, okay. Army doctors close holes. I said, okay, fine. So no expectations. I come out. I go to his office 10 days after the surgery. And he looks at me. And then he starts 
yelling and brings in his staff. They bring in all their, their uh, iPhones. They're all taking pictures. They're labeling it. And he goes, this is my work. I did this. You know? <laughs> he was just closing holes. But I was healing. I was self-healing. There's a difference. I never fought it. You got something wrong with you? You fight it, you make it worse. Do the logical medical steps. You go to a doctor, you get new, whatever medicine, whatever procedure you want to do. Whatever you believe in, if you believe in it good enough, it'll work. If you believe Indian medicine, Ay Ayurvedic, is that what you call it? If that works for you, great. If, if acupuncture works for you, great. It probably works for you. If you believe fasting works for you, fast. If you believe Western medicine works, great. If you believe that surgery is going to work, great. Do it. 90% of your cure is believing the tool that's being used. Well, if you come around me, these are my tools. And I believe in the energy that's within me to heal myself. I want you to believe in the energy within you to heal yourself. All of you. You already know you got it. You do that work. Okay? It's there. And what I have, since I've been telling you guys all day in, in the sermon and here, we're all one. Well, if I got it, you got it. I can't all of a sudden, well, I'm special one, but you guys aren't. No, it's all one. It's just that I'm not so heavy into the dream. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. There we go. All right. So... One day, after healing my teeth, remember that story, healing the teeth, I, I was walking and I jarred or something and my back went out. Anybody just do something all of a sudden? How many bad backs? Bad backs in here? See a couple? Okay, yeah, okay. Everybody in, that's like the, a toothache or, or something in the eye is bad. Back aches, there's no relief. You know, you, you sit, stand, lay down, uh, nothing works, right? The pain of a back will keep you up wake-wise, but it, it, it's, there's no rest for the wicked, right? So I made this move and the back collapsed. According to the doctors, when they looked at 20 years before, whatever amount of years, when they measured my, my, my height and everything, I was an inch and a half shorter in 20 years, so I don't know if it happened at that moment or over the 20 years, but all the spinal the columns were on top of each other. And it was like collapsed. There was no spaces left. It was terribly painful, even for a guy like me that deals with pain. And I kind of crawled into my computer room, and I sat in the chair, and, I, and all I did was sit there and recall healing the teeth, healing the nose, healing all these little things. I just had three or four minutes of memories of previous healings. And that's all it took. I got it from the chair. There was nothing wrong with my back. I'm sure if you x-rayed it, it still looks bad. But like anything that's wrong with you, if there's no pain, who cares? <laughs> okay, it's crooked. All right, it's damaged. But I don't feel the pain. That was my attitude, Right? Because you know, I didn't straighten out. You watch me. I'm still kind of crooked and everything else. But there's no pain. And it was because I've been practicing this self-love for so long and so hard and many, many surgeries and many, many opportunities that just the mere thought of my previous successes was all it took. Just thinking, oh, it's gone. That's much more profound than it sounds. It really is. It was like, I mean, even I was impressed. I was going, holy cow, I don't even have to do all this anymore. So when I started off, I had to do this, I love me, I love me, all these things, and do the whole thing. And it could be a long time. And it got shorter and shorter until it just got down to like a minute or two. You know, I love you. And down to now just remembering, I, just remembering my ability to heal myself. So... That's the first technique we're going to talk about, loving yourself. So if there's a part of your body right now 
knee, back, shoulder. Put your hand wherever the problem is, heart, whatever, face. If it's interior, just put it on your stomach. Just put it there and close your eyes. Visualize, visualize your love. How are you going to visualize your love? You know, maybe it's visualizing hearts going to it. Maybe it's just visualizing light around that part of the body. But love, I love whatever part of that body is. I love me. And you love the shoulder. You love the, the back. You love the cheek, whatever it is. You love it. Just love it. That body part is there to serve you and has served you faithfully. Be grateful for that. Gratitude, right? Be grateful for all the service you've gotten from that. But you just realize just by injecting it with imaginary light and energy, which is not imaginary, but in your mind right now it is, through your spine, through your chakras, coming out your fingertips, in your hands to that part of the body. There's energy there. Love it. And if you've done something to cause it, through exercise, accident, diet, injury, lifestyle, whatever it is, apologize to that part of the body. Sorry. If you don't know what you did wrong, be like a good husband. Apologize anyway. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You're always wrong. Okay? And then you need to look at what good will come out of this. What's, what's, what should I be grateful for? Well, for one thing, you should be grateful for all the years it didn't hurt you. You should be grateful for your life. You should be grateful for the fact that you're still mentally there enough to even think about this. Be grateful for everything that's happened to you, even the so-called bad. Don't start judging things as good or bad. There's just stuff happening to you. Stuff. Your interpretation of, okay, take your hand off there now. I love you, all right? Now, what, what, uh, that is the basic method. Now, if you want to, let's say you got a grandkid or, let's get real, a sick puppy, a dog, a cat, you want to give it energy. You ever wonder why animals enjoy being petted? Think about that one. You've got cats, right? Who's got cats, dogs? You pet a dog or you pet a cat, you're transferring your energy into that animal's soul. You're changing and upgrading their cat soul or dog soul frequency. You're elevating their frequency. And if a dog or a cat is faithfully serving a family for a long period of years and passes, there's a good chance that animal We'll move on from a group soul, you know, all these dogs, to an individual soul and move up the evolutionary chain. It's very important for men, women, when you got a pet, to really love it. It is spiritual evolutionary change for that pet. Now, same thing can be said for a plant. You got a plant in your house. Don't ignore it. I talk to my trees, and I'm going to tell you a story. It's in the book, and this has got nothing to do with the rest of this. But I, in my new book coming out in about two weeks, three weeks, I talk about Bob the Redwood Tree. I don't know if you heard the story. I haven't put anything out there on it. I've, anyway, I, I, it was about 30 years ago, I went into a nursery, and they had all these beautiful big cans, and, you know, you could buy a redwood tree for, you know, thirty, forty dollars, and it's six foot tall, and and then over in the corner was a half milk carton filled with dirt, not even potting soil, dirt. And somebody had this like stick high, thin, said giant sequoia. And I'm going, what? Are they kidding me? I pick it up. What I felt for this tree, I felt like Charlie Brown discovering a perfect Christmas tree. It was like, no. My wife's going, no, no. No, 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 we got these over here. I go, this one needs a home. It's a giant sequoia. It's pencil high. There are no branches, just a couple little things. And I said, I'm taking it. So I go to the counter to buy it, and they look at me like, where in the hell did you get that? It's got no tags on it, no, 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 no numbers, no scans. 
So she calls in the manager, and the manager looks at her and says, oh, we don't even carry this. I don't know. He says, what do you give us for it? I said, 50 cents. He goes, sold. So I left her with this 50-cent tree. I planted it. For 30 years, I went out, and I talked to it every day. I touched it. I loved it. When it got big enough, I started hugging it. 135 feet, 30 years. And then a wind came, 75 mile an hour gust. And it was starting to lean, and I was worried about my neighbors and everything. And I had to make a decision to kill Bob. Believe it or not, it wasn't the $4,000 I was spending to kill a 50 cent tree. It was the fact that I was killing a friend. And I was there when they chopped it down and cut it. So you thought I was a warrior. I'm telling you right now, Redwood Tree made me weep. It was really sad to see 135 feet of tree go down, you know, a piece at a time. That was really hard. So, but love made it grow. If you love your pets, if you love your animals, if you love your plants, if you love your planet, there's a chance we're going to change something. There's healing energy in loving anything. Okay, we got that. Let's go into this. All right, when I'm doing healing on myself, how many people belong to SRF or are familiar with the lessons? Okay, energizing exercises I talked about earlier. But when you go to their temples and services, at the end they got a healing thing, and they rub their hands together. You ever wonder about that? Causes friction, gets the energy flowing, gets the atoms going. This works. This will work. For those that do energy work that way, this. This will work. But you've got to get the energy flowing into your hands. So if you're doing work like with your stuff, you should be doing something with your hands before you work on somebody. That gets the energy there. So everybody kind of do that. You've got the energy, all right? So when I do people, I do that. I'm strong enough to do a whole group. But uh, if you're doing a part of your body, kind of do this. Touch wherever you're going to do. And I love you. Forgive me. I'm grateful. Figure out how you work that. And I'm telling you, you have to accept this on face value. Kanye has seen it first. She knows exactly what I'm talking about, and it does work. It even surprises me at times, honestly. Uh, one more healing story that happened in Europe. Um, we were... Where were we at? We're in the Bavarian Forest in Germany at this hotel. The hotel was letting me stay there for free in this five-star place. Only thing they asked of me was, can I do a free workshop for their employees and family? A few people from the friends from the town. And I go, I get the whole facility, free food, everything. Yeah, great, no problem. So we did a three-day event. Now, first day that you do something like that, it's like this is only a couple hours here, right? You get, I get a certain energy set, but imagine coming back three days and you got long days, and on the third day you're vibrating. The whole group is vibrating. How many people we have in that? Was it 60, 70, 50? 35 to 40. Oh, you're not an Irishman. <laughs> anyway. So. On the third day, this lady comes in. She's German, which was interesting because we were in Germany. What a coincidence. <laughs> and she didn't speak English, and she was crying. And she's saying, I didn't have a clue what she said. So I asked Dave Schultz, for those that know Dave Schultz, uh, to interpret for me. And he said that she went and she called her sister, who was in hospice, with some kind of cancer, I don't know, bone cancer, spinal cancer, something. It was really painful, whatever kind of cancer she had. And when she tried to talk to her on the phone before the, the, the workshop, she was just crying and sobbing and couldn't carry on a conversation because she was in so much pain. And then she looked at me and she says, uh, can we remotely do something for her? And that's when I gave her that famous thing. I tell everybody, there is nothing remote. It's only now. It's only here. There's nothing remote. It's all here, right? So, but I've been teaching people, and I continue to teach people that your buy-in on this is is is, is necessary. You know, if you want, you got to buy in on this. You got. But here's a case, and, and we got cases like this from several events. 
where the people weren't there. They didn't know we were praying for them. They didn't know we sent them healing energy. They knew absolutely nothing. But the minute that we sent that healing energy, we kind of had kind of, you were doing the home chance for her. And we had the whole, as a whole group, we were in a big group hug, you know, with at least 10 people, 20, 30, 30. Okay. Anyway, so we had all these people, and then we had our hands up, and we sent it to this lady, and then we went to lunch. Lady comes back from lunch, and she's happy. She talked to her sister. Oh, yeah, it's just unbelievable. And, and she goes on and says, I called my sister. The pain was gone. And it was gone the exact moment that we'd sent that. Exact moment. She didn't know we were going to pray for her. She didn't ask for us to pray for her. She was expecting nothing. So that I'm going, geez, I'm telling all these people you got to buy in on this thing. It's almost like placebo, right? And here we got a thing going, there's no placebo effect at all. It's the effect of love. Just pure love from a group of people. Just sending frequency of love. Closer to home. What's that little church over here we did? Santa Rita? Santa Anita? I was doing it, which I'm going to do in a few minutes, doing the hands-on. And I go to this table, and uh, the minister's there, whatever her name is, Reverend... Rim Jim. And she looks at me and she goes, Well, if this works so good, can you do something remotely? And I can give her the same spiel. There's no remote. She says, Well, we got this parishioner who had a stroke. And she's probably not going to come out. She had a coma. Yeah, coma for three weeks, I think, or something crazy. It's a, yeah, I don't know details that well, but I know she was in a coma and it was a long time and, and they were looking at it like, uh, you know, can you do anything? And I said, yes, we can. I was a little more confident. Yes, we can. And we, and I had you home and we all had everybody home and we sent love. What was it, two, three days later? We got a message from her. I think I shared it with you. Two or three days later, I get a message from the minister. She went, went to visit her. Not only was she out of a coma, but she was feeding herself. And <laughs> those who have had dealt with people with strokes, you know that's a big deal. And she was going to be going to rehab right away. But she was already healing. And she just said she's doing really well. That's and what's that? Update. She's doing really, yeah. doing really well. Witness. <laughs> All right. And I'm pretty sure it's all her spirit at the time now. And that's, you know, she's back with family. Yeah. All right. All right. And that's, so that's only been a few months. And that other lady, we thought she was like a toxic kind of lady that you like, I can only take the pain away. But it turns out that lady, she said she's actually fully healed. And yeah, yeah, back. the minor detail I left out. Yeah, she actually, <laughs> we healed her in the process. She didn't die. I was just happy she was pain-free. So I don't guarantee the rest. Why does that work? The common denominator is love. So we're going to, I'm going to give each of you some energy here, we're starting to go around the circle. If you don't want me to do it, because you don't even want me to be touched, but if you're here, trust me, I want you to look into my eyes as I do you. Take your glasses off when I do you. Look into my eyes. I want you to see reflected your own image. It's not me doing anything for you. It's you doing something for you. Okay? And then I'm going to go up to you and I'm going to I'm going to tap right here your spiritual eye. Hopefully not tap your eyeball out, but I'll hit the eye. I'll be watching. And I want you to close your eyes and focus on that spot. And then I'll put a hand on the front of your head and back of your head. And I used to, kind of you know this, I used to really give a energy shock, but it was really people literally falling out of the chairs and crying and hysteric. No, seriously, seriously. And now I've toned it down to a... a, a What's a, a slower charge, like if you were slow charging an electric vehicle? Not, not a, yeah, you go from supercharged down to a slow charge. But the energy's there. I've just made it softer because people can't handle that sudden burst. So trust me, it's still there. I just make it easier for you to digest and absorb it. What I'm doing is I'm taking my energy and I'm charging your spiritual batteries. Okay? So what happens after that point, it's yours, not mine. I don't want the karma, one way or the other. 
right? It's not Reverend Bill going to heal you. Think of this as we talked earlier about water, right? It's the water is the source. If you're thirsty, you go to the tap. You turn it on, the water comes through. I'm just the tap. I'm just the pipe. I'm not the water. So, as Bruce Lee once said, be the water. Be the water. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to go around. I'm going to start, start here, and I'll work all the way around the circle. And I want you just to be receptive. So I'm going to give you a few seconds. If we get this thing down, we don't have to do, I mean, I used to do a couple of minutes. No, this is so subtle now, I don't need to. What makes it effective is you just got to open your heart. You got to go, you, you got to want it. I will give you as much as you're willing to take. Okay? Hang on, let me, I get hot when I do this. Okay. Okay. Let's just say a general prayer. I'll just say a general prayer. Heavenly Father, Bless all of us. Let your love radiate within. Let us all join energies together. Realize that we're all one. Amen. Okay, take your hat off, kid. Okay. Look me in the eyes. See yourself. You are the healer. You are the teacher. You're your own guru. Look here. Bless you. Okay, look me in the eye. See yourself. Focus here. Look up there. Close your eyes. Sure, huh? What's going on here? Okay. Look here. Look in my eyes. See yourself. You are the healer. You're the teacher. Okay. You and I are one. That's unusual. Colored eyes. What colored eyes are those? Green. Blue, green, what? Gray. They, they change colors. Okay. Yeah. I say that because there's two things. I haven't said it in a couple workshops. There's power in healing in the hands, but the greatest power in healing is the eyes. And that's why I look you in the eyes. I just don't emphasize it anymore, I guess. But it's greater healing comes from me looking in your eyes. Okay? See yourself. Focus here. Close your eyes. Sure. 
iglesia. Your eyes focus down. Watch you. Focus right here. See yourself. Close your eyes. Bless you. For those I've done, as you sit there, take that energy I've given you and send it to that part of you that you feel needs it. Or you can just sit there and let leave it in God's hand to send it where it needs to go. Okay? But you're charged. This will be the highest frequency you'll have for the week. Take advantage of it. It's a good day to meditate tonight. Close your eyes, focus there. Bless you. Bless you. Focus there.
focus here. Close your eyes. Okay, let's all, you're going to have to help me with this. Get everybody in the middle here, big circle right around us. We're going to send healing, love, and energy to the people in, in your world, your circle, your friends. Get real close, right in here, shoulder to shoulder, energy to energy. All right, what we're going to do, Kanye, where are you at? Why don't you get in your circle? I want you to. Yeah, I want you here. I want you to do. We're going to send, after I tell them what's going on, we're going to send three ohms. Everybody raise their hands, their fingers up, send energy out. We're going to send energy to those who are not here that you want to send your love and your energy to. Spiritually, mentally, or physically, doesn't matter. But as a group, we're going to send this love. And who just had a new baby? Uh, yeah, uh, What's the name of it? God knows. Okay, we're going to send it to the, her grandchild. Uh, Lilia. No, Lilia. 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 God Lilia. will know. <laughs> Lilia. All right. Let's raise our hands. It's yours. You don't have to repeat. Just want you to hear. Heavenly Father, bless us. As the Native Americans had blood brothers, we have own brothers and sisters here today. Connect our hearts forever. When we practice our energy, we remember the energy of this group. Go forth. Become a vehicle for love. Love conquers evil. <laughs> 